Um, I'm a historian, uh, but analysts asked me firstly to say a little bit about the state of uh, arts funding in Britain and arts institutions. Uh, I'll talk for about 10 minutes about that before moving on to talk about anarchism and the way in which it may relate to your concerns and speaking today. Um, Last night in particular, I was astonished uh, to be with Reed Sweet who was speaking English much better than most English people speak English uh, overnight. And I read my paper and found some of it rather difficult to understand. Some of the words were unusual. So I have tried to simplify what I'm going to say. So, first of all, about arts funding in Britain, to the extent that a historian, but someone very, very interested in all the arts, say, dare I say, say, dare I say, say, dance, um, can do. In Britain, state funding of the arts dates from the 1940s. In 1940, the Committee for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts was founded. An interesting and uh, title, one I like, Committee for the Encouragement of Music and Arts. Uh, it was founded on the outbreak of war <coughs> to improve national morale on the one hand, and secondly to provide employment for artists whose opportunity for work had been reduced by war. But more fundamentally, there had been an increasing belief that traditional sources of patronage were disappearing. And that a new patron was to have, and that patron, of course, was going to be the state. In 1945, this organisation, the Committee for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts, became the Arts Council of Great Britain. It was under the chairmanship of John Maynard Keynes, the great economist, uh, who seemed to be very much the uh, genitor, the creator. Of the uh, Arts Council. And the very favourable origins of and considerable satisfaction initially with state arts policy can perhaps be seen as being symbolised in the person of Keynes. Um, you may think, ah, oh, an economist is very, very dull, but Keynes was an extraordinarily innovative economist. He turned the subject upside down in his head in the 30s, revolutionised it. He was also a connoisseur of the history of arts, who acquired a significant collection of contemporary art for himself, and secondly for his college at Cambridge University. He founded the Cambridge Arts Theatre, which still runs very successfully in the city. And he was the husband of a dancer. He married Lydia Lapacola in the early 20s. Uh, uh, a biography has just been published in Lapacola in English. She is said to be one of the great dancers of the uh, 20th century. And most extraordinary of all, Keynes had been gay up until the early 20s, when he began to attend the forces of the nightly of the Ballet Bruce when he returned to London. He fell in love with the leading ballerina, and it was an incredibly happy marriage. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the power of dance. Uh, <laughs> winning. Uh, Sexuality. <laughs> but Keynes died in 1946, uh, in his early 60s. Someone who was later on to be rather important in the Arts Council was a solicitor, a lawyer, an Arnold Goodman, a Jewish lawyer, who was chairman in the late 60s and early 70s. And I have been saying this in the late 60s. I believe that the last 30 years in this country has demonstrated a profound social change. Within our society, there is now widespread feeling that the provision of drama and music, <coughs> painting and culture in all its broadest aspects is no longer to be regarded as a privilege for a few, but is the democratic right of the entire community. Well, I don't know whether he was in fact correct about that, but I like that formulation, the belief that the enjoyment of the arts 
in their broadest is a democratic right of the entire community. Uh, Arnold Goodman, Lord Goodman as he later became, presided over major devolution to the regions, with regional arts associations being set up from 1966, but with significant input from local authorities, as we call them in Britain, let's say from local government. Dissatisfaction of the system has mounted over the last 20 or so years. <coughs> in 1994, as I now find out, the Arts Council of Great Britain was actually abolished, being replaced by something called the Arts Council of England and similar bodies, okay, for Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Regional arts boards have already been instituted, they were considerably less independent than the previous association. But still with boards of practitioners allocating grants. Then another change of structure, another change of name occurred in 2002. The Arts Council of England and the Tenth Regional Arts Board were merged into a single organisation called Arts Council of England. <coughs> It was the proposed distribution of monies last winter, 2007-2008, that met with unprecedented opposition by the arts community. So virulent was the response of the entire arts community that the Arts Council had to go back and review its distribution of grant. And they made significant changes. Even so, it wasn't much appreciated. Oddly, the crisis has occurred when the available budget has been swollen by a proportion of the income generated by the National Lottery, set in 1994. Do you have a National Lottery Well, a friend of mine called it the National Disgrace when it was set up in England. And I think he was right. I think Britain's um, current success in the big games is generated by the Lottery Fund. But back in 1994, the arts were one of the five designated good causes. And looking at the budget, it's extraordinary how it has grown. But discontent has also swollen enormously. What has gone wrong? <coughs> um, I'm told, I've been talking to a friend of mine who is both an arts administrator <coughs> and also as a small publisher, the recipient of grant A from Arts Council of England, a couple of my books that have been subsidised by them. Uh, I'm told that the trouble is grants are from capital expenditure, so the Arts Council has done very well in the past, putting up the money or getting the money for, say, a new theatre. But then the theatre is left to find everyday money costs. So the grants are for capital expenditure, not for everyday costs. Secondly, there's emphasis on project funding, which lasts only two or three years, and the project is there by the time to, to see it was win. There's criticism of, quote, the love of the new, as opposed to supporting the established. And, as I'm told is the case in Sweden, the Labour governments in Britain from 1997 onwards attempted to use arts policy as a form of social policy. Their priority is on what in Britain we call social inclusion. The emphasis is on socially deprived groups and traditional sense of the working class. And hence, there's been much rhetoric against what is called atheism. It's my culture, and that's gone down very badly in the arts community. Very badly indeed. When Tony Blair, for example, um, welcomed to his country home five stars, but there's a similar uh, relationship with uh, um, practitioners in mainstream arts. 